California solar installers experienced a disastrous 2023 as soon as the NEM3 rate changes took effect. The California Solar and Storage Association reports about an 80% drop in rooftop solar projects since April. You know, and this is California. And to make matters worse, the California Public Utilities Commission closed out 2023 by approving further changes to net billing that impact the payback on battery exports. And the commission also practically ended the self-consumption of solar for most virtual net metering projects. So, so today we'll see if there's any way to power forward in California with David Dunlap, VP of Product Strategy for the U.S. with Baywa RE. So David, before we try to look forward and offer suggestions for uh, how to survive and dare I say thrive in this new California solar market, which is what we do here at Power Forward, I first want you to, if you can, sum up those like year-end changes and how exactly it is different from what we already kind of assumed was the reality under NEM3. So I think it's important to kind of first separate um, the, the data analytics we're getting, which you cited in your opening there about um, the drop in installed projects, um, which is very noticeable. The data is now there from April through the end of the year. Um, and we're really, all of those are tied to the original um, rollout of the uh, April 16th or whatever, NEM3 and, uh, and the impact there. What you're also referring to is the most recent, just within the last few weeks, changes around specifically the um, separation of delivery and generation charges and the um, the virtual net metering and and whether self-consumption uh, is allowed under those states. So those are the two kind of, I think they were open-ended items within the original NEM3 that needed clarification by the end of the year. And so we've gotten that clarification and first initial analysis is these are bad. These are detrimental to uh, an already um, suppressed uh, solar market. Taking all of that into account, in our last chat, I asked you on a scale of one to 10, how worried I should be as a California solar installer. And you said maybe about a four or five. So first I'm wondering, are you sticking with that? And why or why not? Yeah, in light of this news, I think the way that I was thinking about it was really putting uh, a lot of trust and faith in the California market and the installer's resiliency. Now that we're seeing some of the lost jobs reports um, and the magnitude drop off in the projects, Maybe it's a little conservative, um, but I think that there is still in my mind opportunity to think about the value of selling solar differently than what it was before. And I think that is changing mindset is probably one of the most difficult things uh, to do as a business, as well as as an individual. And if we just kind of take a look back at the broader context of what the California market was under NEM2, it was really lucrative. It was very easy to oversell. It was easy to convince people on a very, very short economic ROI that actually wasn't maybe the uh, idealized system. It was actually oversized. There, 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 this huge um, retail rate revenue stream, if you will, for that system that justified going solar isn't the only reason to go solar, but it, it it caused basically the proliferation of installers and job installations and size of systems and all these other things. But there are a lot of other markets, um, Hawaii and Arizona most notably, that haven't had that opportunity for eight or 10 years now. And I think the toughest part is the transition that we're in now. It's that going from what was very easy to sell 50 jobs a week or 100 jobs a week or whatever it is, to now I have to change how I'm selling. I'm going to get less on uh, sort of the, the conversion rate of my uh, sales calls. And I might not be able to just lean on the economic only argument. So related to the separation of delivery and generation charges, I wanna point out that the reduction of economic benefit of that battery generated uh, and exported power, it, it is a meaningful, economic change, a percent change, but it doesn't prevent you from still having a viable system, right? So again, if we tie the reason we're doing solar and backup uh, battery storage to only economics, it seems like that's a detriment. But if we say we're doing it because we're giving the homeowner autonomy and energy security, then it's kind of moot. 
it doesn't matter, right? And then maybe ultimately, and this is what some of the um, Brad Hevener and some others are, are looking at the, uh, the economics of it, maybe the CPUC will start to see that we've actually created a situation where now they're not gonna get the benefit of that exported power during the times they most want it because it's too limited, right? And, and their complex matrix didn't actually solve the problems it was meant to solve. Um, that's valuable. And I think in the long run, we can expose that and say, look, now this homeowner is gonna export whenever it makes sense for them. Maybe they don't make as much money on the export, but they balance right, their self-consumption and their net export over the course of each month and over the year. So they end up at a neutral net zero, um, which is optimized. And that's appropriate for an autonomous home generating and consuming its own power. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And I do think some of the problems people have with the changes of the uh, the battery export piece of this that happened in the last couple of weeks was they felt like maybe there was a, um, I don't know if I, I want to use the term bait and switch, but in a way that installers were selling systems based off of some assumptions, you know, to customers like, hey, once this is all finalized, this is what you're going to be getting back as an ROI on your system. And then that was kind of like swapped out at the last second. It's like, oh, we've made some sales that now actually aren't tr aren't true. And yes. so that's like an immediate problem that people had. And that maybe going forward, you know, won't seem like as big of a detriment if you kind of work under this new framework. But I guess there was a lot of problems with kind of this last second, like, hey, here's what here's what we're doing instead type of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that's always painful. There's no good argument for it. It's just it's a it's an incomplete um set of assumptions or incomplete set of policies and rules under which we were playing. And it, and it feels like the bait and switch. And it's really unfortunate. We wish that, that that wasn't the case. But at the same time, what is the path forward through that? It's change your, your uh, expectation, change what you're selling. Given the, given the lower demand and the tougher economic argument, let's dig into that just a little bit more, you know, in terms of helping solar installers maintain profitability with that solar and storage installation business model now that they are in a new world, right? It's, 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 a, it's a new mindset, but it's also a new, they, they have to make fundamental changes to their business, right? Uh, I guess you mentioned the sales proposal, but I mean, is there just anything else fundamentally to uh, offer as examples of a way forward with just that solar and storage installation. I think that there's a lot of innovation and an opportunity that can come from it that I can't even predict right now. But I think it's part of the reason for my optimism on on believing that the California installer market is resilient. They're going to figure this out. But I think starting with um, kind of a mindset shift of um, how can you differentiate your offering rather than me too, I'm just gonna offer you the exact same quote that you got five other times, but at a lower price. It's how can I actually differentiate? And in terms of the homeowner uh, goals or needs, I think it's really um, one of two things. Most people make uh, significant purchases based on either an elimination of pain or a move towards comfort and security. And so if the installers can think about how are they gonna differentiate their business, their offering, and they're gonna either take away homeowner pain, which could be the, the high utility bill, or it could be the fear of power outages, something like that, or move toward comfort, which could just be energy security, or um, I'm producing my own power, I'm taking a, a stand on sustainability and climate uh, management by reducing my carbon footprint. Those are those are messages that I think we have always been out there, always been part of the solar proposal or the pro value proposition, but we kind of lost sight of them behind the economic because that was so kind of simple to make. In a down market, where do you want to be? You, there is less opportunity. There's a smaller addressable market. How can you still be relevant and bring value to that market? And if your answer is, I can't because I don't know how to change my business model, it was dependent on massive amounts of top end funnel input, then you need to look at a new market probably, right? Um, but if you're willing to say, I can downsize my business and I can do half to third as many projects, but I can uh, incorporate more revenue and um, less soft cost into those, I might actually generate more profit dollars and at the end of the month, end of the year, still run a healthy, profitable business. Some of the more mature installers have been around 15, 20 years are really seeing a change in their business model from how it was when they started. Um, and I, I'm aware of a few companies that almost, uh, I would say, hazard to say something like 80% of their business is now 
referral and repeat business. People that bought a system from them 10, 12 years ago and now have moved into a new home and are putting solar on their new home because they didn't get to take the system with them. That's very different from having to go out and carpet bomb developments and, and get every single new customer, right? This is built in referral, you know, sort of repeat business from the same customer base. And I, and I think lastly, I think just sort of a word of caution in a down market with less volume of projects opportunity right now is this perfect storm of I'm struggling to, to make as much money. And so I think if I buy cheaper product, which is widely available on the PV side because of a whole separate set of problems. If you kind of follow that economic argument a little bit further and you say you're no longer charging the same amount, you're reducing what you're charging to the homeowner to reflect the lower equipment cost, you're actually generating fewer profit dollars for your business and you're asking your company to run on a reduced revenue and a reduced profit model. So simple math, if your markup was just picking numbers out of the air. I have no idea if these are right or not, but let's say it was 20%. 20% of a dollar is 20 cents, but 20% of 50 cents is only a dime, right? So as, as it, when I'm thinking about funding my business overhead and keeping the business on the rails, each job is contributing a dime or each job is contributing 20 cents. It's actually healthier to have a higher price point um, for your business and robust margins. And if you're just buying cheaper equipment and you're marking it up the same way you always have, you're going to end up reducing the amount of money running through your business. To ask this, I guess, one other way, uh, you know, with the market perhaps being fundamentally different from how I started my solar installation business to now, you know, um, and if, if I'm betting that the, the those glory days of how we've been selling Resi Solar aren't uh, coming back in that same way, what else can I do to still install solar and meet this maybe lessons demand, but also not fully rely on it. And maybe this is here when we talk about ancillary services, thinking about home electrification. You know, I, I guess what else should I maybe be trying to do? Hopefully, if I'm still in business at this point, uh, you know, given the what we already paint the picture we painted, um, what more is there I should be thinking beyond just I'm a solar installer? I think everyone does need to adapt assume the glory days won't be back, and then think about what does that future state look like. And you've got models, you've got Hawaii with a net net zero export policy, right? 100% um, self-consumption. What does it take to be successful in that market? There are many of installers that are doing a robust business. It doesn't mean they were able to, to make that change overnight when the policy changed, but, but they have survived the test of time because they've adapted to what the needs of that market are. I think that you've got to add to the system. You've got to think about what is a whole home uh, energy management system look like that's going to provide a balanced generation and consumption model on a monthly and annual basis. So you've got to have storage. You've got to have load controls. That alone is going to double or, or, or slightly more than double the cost of the system. And if you're using you know, high quality materials, your, um, your margins can still be robust. And then you've got the, what else can I do? So the ancillary things, um, I think adding a robust service uh, entity that is standalone profitable on its own right, not a offshoot of your um, sort of, a, these are expenses I'm gonna have to cover from my uh, the core of my business. But with the downturn, with the unfortunate state of a lot of installers going out of business, there's gonna be a lot of orphan systems. And then electrification, yes, you know, add EV chargers, add heat pumps, whatever you think is gonna be meaningful that you can really get behind um, both from a business standpoint and from a sales standpoint um, for creating value for the homeowner, I think is worth exploring. And don't do everything, pick one, get yeah. good at that, and then maybe layer on the next one. We didn't really get into the changes to the virtual net metering in this discussion, but the CPUC, from what I understand, essentially made it so facilities with shared solar systems, so uh, one system tied to multiple meters that are part of the virtual net metering program, won't be allowed to self-consume that solar, the, the, with the exception of the people renting apartments who will be able to. All classes of these projects that feed multiple meters, like farms and schools, will only learn a much lower export rate for every kilowatt hour of solar they produce. I mean, I don't even know what to say about that. Uh, if, <laughs> is there any path forward for selling and installing systems it, it, like that anymore? 
It's a great question. And and I also am, am similarly stumped at this moment. It, it, it seems wrong to me, um, just kind of philosophically that um, maybe there's a there's a brooch of our fundamental rights to solar power if if the if we're not allowed to self-consume and so maybe there's some details in there that we don't yet understand um but I, I you're right on the surface it sounds like this this just is fundamentally wrong if if you're going to generate solar you should be able to consume that solar power on site and what does it mean to not be able to self-consume? All I really have to say about it right now, because I don't know enough of the details of what's really going on here, is that um, it's important that we support our advocacy groups and 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 those analysts and um, lobbyists for for solar that are saying, "Hey, this looks wrong. Like, let's dig into it. Let's challenge it. Let's say we believe it's wrong and push back on it." Because it's not right that an entire subsegment of the of the market would be off limits to solar. That's clearly not part of the overall California solar goals. Um, and if that's what this uh, specific policy is doing, then it's a mistake. When word of that was spreading, you know, we were I was getting emails from all sorts of advocacy organizations beyond solar. You know, renters, uh, consumer groups, farmers. Like, I mean, just about any group you can think of was like, whoa, what are you doing here with this virtual net metering program? Um, especially for a state that is mandating that all new buildings come with solar. It's not like these are vanity projects we're talking about. You know, they're supposed exactly. to be, this is the whole point of what the state is rallying around. So anyway, David, uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, walk us through all the changes happening in California. And I do feel better about understanding uh, seeing the path forward, it's different, but it could maybe in the long run end up making for a uh, better market, better solar business, and something that's maybe at least cohesive and not so much a back and forth battle of political wills between utilities and solar installers, hopefully from here on out. Let's um, hope so. Yeah. So anyway, thanks for taking the time, David. Appreciate it. Absolutely, Chris.